Anybody else like naps? I like power naps. I like those power naps when you just, man, you, you, you're tired, man. You just, life has worn you out, man. You just, you sit on the couch and you just fall asleep. Five minutes later, you wake up and you're like ready to go. It's a new day. Man, power's come. But man, as much as I like naps, man, I, I, I hate hindrances to those naps. I call them rude awakenings. We know them as rude awakenings. I call them rude awakenings. I hate them so much that my alarm on my phone is set to a calming piano. It's just like some old calm hymn that you would hear. <laughs> I hate hindrances. My dog, Amos, right? I'm going to show you a picture of Amos real quick. Uh, that's him. <laughs> he's, a, he's a nut. He's a nut. He doesn't always look like that, but... A lot of times he does, but uh, Amos thinks cats are the devil. Like, he really does. And that's kind of why I like him. I mean, I'm just, just be honest. I'm not a real cat person, but, uh, man, he, he hates cats so much that, that one day he jumped through the screen in one of our windows just because a cat walked across our front yard. And he's a hound dog, so all he does is just run him up a tree and then comes home. That's, what, that's kind of just kind of like what he does. That's all he does. But it's a lot of times what you see is Amos, man, he'll be sitting there by the, by the back door and just staring out the window, waiting for something to come by. Usually a cat, maybe a possum, maybe a squirrel or a bird, whatever. But he's guarding our house. He's guarding our house from these mischievous little devil cats that just love to come around and, and ruin his day and, and enter his property. But, you know, he likes to do that at night. And mind you, Amos is a hound dog. Okay, so imagine 3 o'clock in the morning, you hear, boop, <laughs> and you're sleeping. That's what I call a rude awakening. You know, my wife and my kids, man, they just love waking me up out of a dead sleep. They love my reaction. I don't know if you're like me. Like, Lisa, I'll just be sitting there on the couch sleeping or something after church, and, and I swear she's probably got her video camera out or something, but she's probably videoing me over there, and all she does is, Dan! I'm like, what? <laughs> I'll wake up, and then Allie, of course, my daughter Allie, I'll be sleeping in the bedroom. She'll just creep on up there. Quiet. Daddy! <laughs> Looks like I'm going into convulsions. But I'm telling you, they love doing it. Look over to your neighbor and tell them to wake up. Now look back over at your other neighbor and tell them to wake me up. All joking aside, though, sometimes we just need a rude awakening. Sometimes we need a wake-up call. Man, I love that video. Uh, there's a portion in that video where it says, Awake, O oh sleeper, you go your own way, seeking pleasure and freedom, but covered in chains. Awake, O oh sleeper, from dust you were made. This life is a vapor and quickly fades. Do we have any golf buffs in here? I know there's, there's one over here, Glenn Drummond. He's just a golf guy. Anybody else? Just raise your hand if you're a golf buff. Man, I love golf. I mean, who needs melatonin when you can just turn on the masters on the Sunday and just fall asleep? <laughs> but if you love golf, you may, you may have heard this story before, but one of the most memorable moments in golf history uh, came when a Scotsman came over here to America in the late 1800s and was going to show Ulysses S. Grant, how to, uh, the President of the United States, how to play this newly, uh, uh, not it was a new game, but it was a new game to America. And so this Scotsman gets up on the tee, puts his ball on the tee, and, and man, he, he, he looks like he's about to do it, and he swings back, and pow! As he comes down, he hits the dirt, and dirt just goes flying all over the place. He's embarrassed. Well, he does it again. Hits the dirt. Dirt goes flying all over the place. This time lands in President Ulysses S. Grant's beard and all over his hair. Two or three more tries. The ball still has not moved off of the tee, and the the president leans over to this Scotsman and says to him, real softly in his ear, not to embarrass him, he says, there seems to be a fair amount of exercise in the game. 
but I failed to see the purpose of the ball. <laughs> I feel like many of us are like that Scotsman. And we swing our golf clubs over and over again at life, and man, all we do is hit anything and everything but the ball. We fling dirt in every direction, damaging our lives and those around us, but never hitting our target. We never hit what's important. We never hit what matters most. We live for things that God never intended us to live for. We spend so much time, so much time worrying about the things that God says that we should not worry about. He said he'll take care of these things, but we have a tendency to worry about them. We spend countless amounts of money on trying to be good at something that we'll never be good at. Trust me, I like bass fishermen, fishing. I wanted to be a pro bass fisherman. Guess what? I spent a lot of money trying to be a good bass fisherman. Look where I'm at today on a Sunday. I'm not in my bass boat winning a Bassmaster Classic. But what are we living for? What are we striving for? What are we focusing our life's attention on? What are we swinging at? What is it that we put so much of our energy into and only find ourselves empty and purposeless? In the words of Craig Groeschel, I love Craig Groeschel. He's the man, by the way. He said it just may very well be that the only enemy to the life God has for you is the life that you're living now. I'll say it again. The only enemy to the life that God has for you may just be the life that you're living now. Do you want more out of this life than what you're currently getting? Do you long for a filling uh, that never comes? Are you swinging and missing at the ball every single time? Listen, take a look at your life. Are you living for what matters most? It's time to wake up and ask ourselves, am I living for what matters most? The title of the message today is Awake, O Sleeper, Living for What Matters Most When It Matters Most. I believe if we're going to uh, live for what matters most, then we better know what matters most, right? So in our text today, we find Jesus. He's making his way on his, his final journey back around towards Jerusalem. And he's been on mission for about three years now. He's been upsetting every single Jewish leader that he can possibly upset along the way in every synagogue that he goes into. And now he comes to this uh, synagogue in Jericho. Now, Jericho would have been about 25 miles away from uh, uh, Jerusalem. So there would have been plenty of Pharisees and scribes. And so, and so Jesus is there. He's teaching in the synagogue. And in walks these men, likely scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem traveling over. And Jesus is listening to them bring to his attention something that happened in Galilee. Look with me in verse number one. It says, uh, there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now, Pilate was the Roman governor at the time, and he was not a very nice man. He was not very friendly, especially to the Jews. Now, the Galileans that he's talking about, the ones that they slew, uh, they were not the most peaceful people in the region at all. Matter of fact, there was a, a band of Galileans that uh, followed this uh, man named Judas uh, Guanita, who rebelled against Caesar, against paying taxes, and against uh, Pilate's men. And so Pilate obviously got sick of it, got annoyed, and went after these men and killed them while they were worshiping in the temple. And so doing blood mingling with the sacrifices, which to the Jews was a heinous thing. So, so these men, these, these Pharisees and scribes visiting the town, uh, tell Jesus about what happened. Now, now Jesus, like his manner was, didn't answer the men the way that they expected him to answer they were hoping for him to lash out and say something like, serves them right. Those low-down lawbreakers, they should have obeyed Caesar. Or maybe, maybe they wanted him to say something along the lines of, how dare Pilate do such a thing? There's no king but God. Caesar has no jurisdiction over God's people. Listen, either responses would have led Jesus into a trap. Because if he had agreed with uh, the fact that they shouldn't have been killed, then, then the Romans would have 
uh, maybe taken him captive, but if, but if they said uh, that they were worthy of killing, then, then maybe Jesus would have looked unmerciful and not loving. And so they were trying to catch Jesus in a trap, but man, Jesus didn't say anything along those lines. Look at verse number two. He says, And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all Galileans because they suffered such things? He said, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. What's Jesus trying to say here? Jesus doesn't skirt around petty surface level stuff. He goes straight to the heart. What Jesus is trying to tell these men and all who were in listening range is, look, you think these men were deserving of God's judgment? He says, look at yourselves. My first point here in Awako Sleeper is repentance matters. Listen, we say amen to that, right? We know repentance is good. We, we shake our heads, but, but how often do we look at people's lives and think, man, they need to get right with God. They need to turn their lives around. Or maybe something bad happens to them, and you say, oh, man, they got what they deserve. They shouldn't have been living like that. They should have been living for themselves. They shouldn't have disobeyed the law. Listen, let me tell you, we may not say it, but deep down we think it. Shame on us. Who are we to judge? Who are we to judge somebody that's in that position? Jesus said, I tell you, nay. He says, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. We all need repentance. We all need his grace. We all need his goodness and mercy in our life. And as a matter of fact, if it wasn't for God's goodness towards unrighteous sinners, none of us would be saved. Romans 2, verse 3 and 4 says, And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Listen, it's the goodness of God that led every single one of you here to repentance. Sometimes... Sometimes the hard things that are happening in people's lives are happening because God is drawing them to himself. And who are we to judge that situation? Who are we to judge? Repentance is simple, though. Listen, you were going one way. You were heading in your own direction. You were heading in the direction of destruction. And then all of a sudden, you met Jesus. You found out that there's a better life. And so you, you changed the direction you were going in that direction. You turned to that better life and you started following Jesus. You gave up all your sins and you just followed the Lord. That's repentance. That's simple. Repentance matters and repentance matters now for all of us. So what do we have to do? We have to awake to change. We have to wake to change for the, for the unbeliever here. The life you're living isn't cutting it, is it? Listen, change your path. Change your destination. There's destruction in the life that you're heading right now, but, but there's blessings and there's, there's goodness of God in the life that God wants you to have. If you're here today, and man, your life has been through the ringer, can I tell you that God loves you enough that he has a better plan for your life? He has a plan of goodness. He has a plan for uh, blessings. And, and man, the only enemy to the life that he has for you is the life that you're living now. Turn to God in repentance. For the believer here, what are you living for right now? What are you living for right now? Are you living for your kingdom? Or are you living for God's kingdom? That's a sobering question. What are you living for right now? What we all have to do is you have to choose to change your life before your life changes you. Choose to change your life before your life changes you. There has to be an awakening to the change that needs to take place uh, in your life. So we have to awake to change. Look with me in verses 6 through 9. It says, uh, he spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? 
And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well. And if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Jesus had finished addressing these self-righteous Pharisees, these men, and showing them their need to repent. And what he's trying to say here in this parable, he's trying to, to wake these people up. He's saying, listen, wake up. Wake up, O sleeper. Patience matters. God's patience matters. Look at me in verse number six. He said, he spake unto uh, also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. Listen, that, that, that certain man uh, in this parable is God. A certain man is God. That fig tree is the nation of Israel. That vineyard is God's kingdom. It's here. It's this earth. God sees this fig tree, Israel, that he has planted where they're at. He's planted it there for a purpose. Now, a fig tree in those days were meant to bear fruit, but they wouldn't always bear fruit. It usually took a few years for them to start producing fruit. And when they did, but even through those, those few years, there would still be some fruit that would never be used. It's just there showing what is to come. But, but here in this parable, uh, this certain man, this owner of the vineyard, is walking through his vineyard and coming to this fig tree for three years and never finding any fruit on it. Not, never even seeing hope for it. But seeing purposelessness on it. And so he goes and he says, and he came and, and sought fruit thereon and found none. And then in verse number seven, uh, verse number seven, this vineyard uh, dresser, he says, then he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. He said, cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Well, that, 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 uh, that dresser of the vineyard here is Jesus. And the, the three years that he's talking about here, uh, could refer to one of two things. Could it refer to the entire history of, of Israel from, uh, from, from Abraham and, and uh, from then on to where they're at right now? Or it could refer to the three years that Jesus was there on earth. Regardless of what it refers to, it's referring to Israel's existence here in God's kingdom. The thing about this fig tree when the dresser or the, the, the owner says, why cumbereth it the ground? That phrase, cumbereth the ground, is very, very important. The word cumbereth means to, to render useless or unproductive, or to occupy un, unprofitable. The effects of a, of a fruitless tree would have been detrimental to the ground around it. It would be sucking up all of the nutrients. It would be sucking up all of the juices that, that would help other trees in the area uh, thrive if it wasn't there. It was still sucking nutrients up. It's talking about the good graces of God. Listen, Israel was in God's kingdom. Israel enjoyed the blessings of God. God had poured out every single blessing on them that you, you get today. He gave them a land flowing with milk and honey. He was a protector. He blessed them because they were chosen by God. But the problem was it was taking up space. Look at verse number 8. And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. Listen, Jesus loved the nation of Israel. In Matthew 23, he said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. Jesus loved the nation of Israel. God loved the nation of Israel. They're your chosen people. 
But because of his love for Israel, Jesus requests God to show patience. He knows that he, has, he still has a work to do in going to the cross. He knows there's still an opportunity for them to change. He knows that if the fig tree has another year to show fruit, it has a chance to produce. He said, but if not, let it go. Listen, the dresser isn't done working. He's given it another shot at life. He's given it another shot at producing fruit. The same challenge that Jesus had to Israel back then is the same challenge he has to his church today, to you today. You that lay barren, you that cumbereth the ground, you that are in danger of being cut down, awake to fruitfulness. What are you doing to advance the kingdom of God? Do you just occupy a pew like the fig tree in the garden? Or are you there? Are you there giving it your all? Are you giving God everything that you have to offer? The good graces that he's poured into your life, are you pouring it back out? Are you a giver or are you a taker? We have a responsibility, church, to not just come and warm the pews. We have a responsibility to be a a testimony, a tree in the garden of God's vineyard, bearing fruit. question I have for you is, are you taking advantage of God's grace and patience, or are you taking it for granted? Don't take it for granted. Listen, the year of God's patience may soon be up. You don't know. You don't know when that is. We need to take advantage of the patience of God and awake to fruitfulness, but not only does repentance and and God's uh, patience matter, but, but also rest matters. Now, some of you may be thinking, amen, preacher. It's Sunday. I'm tired already. It's only 945 in the morning. I'm ready to go home and take that power nap that you were talking about that you love so much. Let's get it going, right? Is that what you're saying? Amen, preacher. Maybe some of you are thinking, wait, I thought, I thought this message was uh, awake, oh, sleeper. What do you mean rest matters? Well, well, hang on, just bear with me for just a minute. Look at verse number 10, please. <clears throat> it says, and he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, <clears throat> there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together, and could in no wise lift herself. Here, Jesus is teaching in a synagogue on the Sabbath day. This is a different Sabbath day, uh, shortly after the one that we were just at. And and he's teaching here, and, uh, and he sees a woman walking in. And this woman had a a spirit of infirmity, the Bible says. She was bowed over. And and I have a picture here. They'll probably put it up there on the screen for you of this lady, what it would have looked like. Coming up. (laughs) There you go. So this woman doesn't look very comfortable, does she? This This is a typical picture of what a woman that is bowed over uh, would look like. She would have a couple couple canes. You see those two canes that she's carrying? Not just one, but two. She's carrying two canes as if she's walking on all fours. And you see the hunchback that she has. And you know, this was not a very uh, easy thing for people to deal with back then, and a lot of pain. A lot of pain associated with it. As a matter of fact, it was she was so bowed over, the Bible says that she could in no wise lift herself up. She was bound. Matter of fact, it would have been even hard to look where you were going because you were constantly bowed over like that. Can you imagine? Trying to keep your head up at that angle. All she's able to see is the ground that's in front of her. There's nothing she could do. She was bound, locked up. Doctors said that, uh, say that this woman that they're talking about here in, in, the, in the Bible likely 
because she had been going through this uh, dilemma, this condition, this infirmity for, for so long that her vertebrae would have fused themselves together like that. You're not getting up. It's like trying to bend all the way backwards and touch your toes. It's just not going to happen. So it was for this lady. She was bound. Nothing she could do at all. Just a little side note here. I just want to plug this in. You notice where she is on the Lord's day? Regardless of the condition that she's in, I just want to say, sometimes all it takes is a sneeze for some of y'all to stay home. <laughs> but this lady, she's, she's where she needs to be. That's a good lesson for us to, 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 to learn, but that's a later message. We won't talk about that. But what do you think Jesus is going to do here? Man, Jesus is going to do what Jesus is going to do, man. He's going to heal. That's Jesus. That's, that's our Savior. He heals. He's a healer. He's a protector. I love the fact that Jesus, uh, Jesus heals. But look with me in verse number uh, 12. It says, uh, and when Jesus saw her, he called her to him. Now, I find it very, very interesting at this moment that it wasn't the lady that came calling for Jesus. I said it wasn't the lady that came calling for Jesus. It was Jesus came calling for her. I wish I had some Christians up in here that got excited about what Jesus does. Amen? Come on. Come on. Jesus came calling for her. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that, that he called her to himself, and before she even called, he answered the call. I'm thankful 2,000 years ago, Jesus answered the call before I ever called for him. I don't have to worry about where I'm going when I die because I know Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins 2,000-something years ago, and I'm living in that today. I don't have to call on him anymore. He came answering that call then. Praise the Lord. But listen, Jesus Proclaim to this woman, thou art loosed from thine iniquity. He says, thou art loosed. Listen, you know that carries with it a beautiful, beautiful meaning in the Greek. It means to be fully free. It means literally to relieve, release, dismiss, or rid somebody of something. The only thing stopping God from setting you free from the broken life that you're living right now is your willingness to answer his call to come to him. Did you know that? That's the only thing. It's your willingness to answer the call that he's calling to you. So what's my challenge to you here? Listen, my challenge to you here today is awake to freedom. Awake to freedom. Listen, Satan, man, I, I hate Satan, man. He has so many people bound in this world today. Oh, we're pretty up in here, man. We got our nice clothes on. We're in our Sunday best, man, whatever that may be. But you walk out these doors, you go up the street, go pull into Walmart, go walking through Walmart a little bit. I know some of you guys don't like Walmart because it's full of gross and disgusting people. But let me tell you something, those gross and disgusting people were you one day before you were saved. Who are you to judge? I take offense to that because I'm a Walmart shopper, okay? <laughs> I like Walmart. And I may not be dressed all perfect all the time, but bless God, Walmart's cheap, and I like going there. <laughs> but Satan does, man. He has people bound today. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. In whom the God of this world, that's Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. Listen, I'm thankful that Jesus is in the business of opening blinded eyes and setting souls free, aren't you? 
Man, I'm so thankful for that. We need to awake to freedom. There's freedom to be had in Jesus. There's a Savior that loves you. There's a Savior that that begged God for Israel, that he would have patience on them enough so that he can complete his work in them so that you can be saved today. And he loves you enough. He loves you enough that he puts up with us even when we're a little foolish. He gives us his graces when we act like dummies. I'm thankful for a God that offers freedom to his people. Psalm 146, verse 8 says, The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind, and the Lord raiseth them that are bold together. The Lord loveth the righteous. Did you catch that middle phrase? That the Lord raiseth those that are bold? Remind you of a lady in our story today, bold together. This was a prophecy. I believe, of that. He opens blinded eyes. He sets prisoners free. He raises the boat. He sets you to sit out of the mighty or miry clay to sit in the high places where the princes are at. Listen, that's God's people. That's what Jesus does for us. We're in a life that's, that's caught up in chains and, and man, sin. And, and, man, you may even be there now as a Christian. You may be walking through this Christian life defeated because of the sin that you're that you're caught up in. You may be bound in it. Listen, there's addictions. I understand. I totally get the addictions in this in this place. You're probably suffering with it right now. But I know that there's a God in heaven that sets prisoners free. There's a God in heaven that 2000 years ago went to a cross so that you could be free. He took the stripes on his back. He took the nails in his hands and his feet and willingly died in your place so that you could have life and so that you could have it more abundantly. Listen, are you you a saved Christian today? Walk in freedom. There's no better life for you than the life that God has planned for you. But the only enemy to that life could be the life that you're living right now. Jesus said, I come. I came to give life and to give it more abundantly. Listen, just one touch, just one touch from the master is all that it takes to break the chains in your life. Just like he did with this lady, touched her, healed her. Man, that's all it took. And she immediately, can you imagine that? Those fused up vertebrae, hunched down for 18 years, immediately Jesus touches her and whoop. Salvation, folks. Listen, when you get saved, you're saved forever. Things change. He said, when you get saved, listen, Oh, uh, give it to me now. Uh, you're a, uh, a new creature in Christ. He said, behold, all things have become new. Like that. And I mean like that. It's not a process. You don't get saved after walking a road of, of good works and walking a road of uh, being a, a good person and faithfully attending church and, and teaching a Sunday school class and, and giving your money to the church or, or doing good outside of the community. No, you get saved. When you get saved, it happens like that. When I got saved, February, I think, no, it was March 15th in 2009, right there, by the way, I walked out of this building and saw life differently. I literally saw life. The way I perceived things was completely different. 
Oh, I no longer had to walk in that darkness anymore. It was like somebody took sunglasses off of me and I started walking in this newness of life and I started seeing people for the souls that they were. I started seeing my family different. I started seeing my, my friends different. The places that I go, I don't go there anymore. Why? Because things changed. Just one touch changes you. But one thing you can count on is that when God is working in people's lives, Satan is working just as hard to wreck and ruin God's plan for those lives. Look at me in verse number 14. It says, And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work, and them therefore come and be healed and not on the Sabbath day. Man, that, that ruler of the, the, the synagogue, he was a wicked man. He was a wicked man. In all aspects, he looked right on the outside. He looked like he fit in. But listen, he tried to threaten the people with God's law. He says, in six days, you got six days where you can come and be healed up here. Six days. The seventh day, don't do anything. You can't be healed on that day. This is Sabbath day. This is the day of rest. You don't do any work. Jesus stepped in and offered the rest that this woman needed to oppose to the demands of the law. Look at verse number 15. Jesus said, and the Lord answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, doth not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall and lead him away to watering? And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? Thou hypocrite! He says, you loose your ox. You lead them to water on the Sabbath day. What about this woman, this human being, this daughter of Abraham? Should not she be loosed? Listen, I love how, how, how Jesus counteracts every bit of evil in this world, every bit of Satan's uh, attempts to, to thwart people uh, being saved and, and, and Satan's attempts to, to thwart the gospel being moving forward and God's kingdom uh, being established here on this earth. I love how Jesus interacts uh, with this man. He says, thou hypocrite. You worry about your ox more than this poor woman. You worry more about the letter of the law than you do the spirit of the law. The spirit of the law, by the way, is love. That's the reason the law was made. There are so many people trying to do good to get to heaven. No one's able to do it. The law is love. You shall not kill. You know what? If you love somebody, you're not going to kill them. If you love somebody, you're not going to steal from them. If you love your parents, you're going to obey them. You're going to honor them. The law is love. The law is love. And this woman found freedom. This woman found hope. This woman, woman found rest in Jesus. Listen, Jesus put that ruler of the synagogue to shame. And Jesus does the same thing with Satan today. Look at verse number 17. <clears throat> and we'll be finished. And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed. And all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Listen, it's nice to know that Jesus is able to put the enemies of your life to shame. It's nice to know that, isn't it? One day we're going to stand before the Savior rejoicing in all the glorious things that he's done for us while our enemies stand by ashamed. I'm thankful for a God that has a plan for each one of us, that protects us when our enemies try to surround us and try to keep us from the life that God has for us. I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Psalm 23 says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of of mine enemies, my cup runneth over. 
all. Can you imagine? The picture of that phrase right there. A table spread. You're sitting at that table. Who's preparing that table for you? Oh, that's God. That's Jesus. He's preparing this table for you in the presence of your enemies, by the way. Listen, they're going to look and see all the blessings that God has for you in your life and be ashamed. And you're going to look on that, all the blessings that God has for you, and say, thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. You know, when, when the Bible says, you, when he says, you anointest my head with oil, do you know that the, the only person that would get their head anointed at the dinner table would have been the guest of honor? Jesus, anoint your head with oil because you're special to him. You're the guest of honor at his table. And that's something that we ought to be rejoicing about. You don't get quiet about something like that. I mean, I'd, if I wasn't up here, I'd probably run around the room. <laughs> but in the beginning of the message, and, and we'll have our people come out and uh, the musicians come on out now, but in the beginning of the message, I quoted Greg Rochelle a couple times. He said, it may just be that the only enemy to the life that God has for you is the one that you're living today. But in order for us to experience those blessings here on earth and in our own lives, we need to listen to God's call to awake, O sleeper, to change. Change from the ways that, that we think are best for us to the ways that God says are best for us. We need to hear him cry out, awake, O oh sleeper, to, to, to change. We need to hear him cry out, awake, O oh sleeper, to fruitfulness. Listen, don't cumber the ground with selfishness and, and pride anymore, but bear the fruits of righteousness for the sake of the kingdom of God and his church. Lastly, we need to hear the call to awake to freedom. There's a better life than the one that you are living right now that has you bound up and chained and bowed over. You just need to turn to Jesus and be freed.